songs that sing for me My heart beats when it could not sing a P One G, play some keys to sing for me I get hooked to the chorus guaranteed uh, I'm a tempo tempo Music takes you to the place it came from Instrumentals in your mental echoes In your subconscious it sits and set those Catch Amazing Minds Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays, 20 hours Central African time on YouTube, Google, Apple and Spotify for podcasters. Zambia's first late night show. This will be an interesting year, I believe. How was your Christmas and your New Year? And did you guys miss me? I feel like we've been away for a while. I'm glad to be back. Uh, yeah. How are you guys doing? Today is Friday Bible Talks. You're welcome to Amazing Minds, Zambia's first late night show. If you're not subscribed, please subscribe, hit that bell and share. Uh, subscriptions alone on YouTube are decorations. If you don't hit that bell. So the show is available Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays, 20 hours Central African time. And you can listen to the podcast on Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Same time, same days. Uh, Mondays are for the political segment of the show. Uh, dubbed the Monday show. Wednesdays are for the educative segment, dubbed the Wednesday show. And Fridays are for Bible Talks. So today we are continuing with a series we did not uh, finish last year. Our last episode was with Reverend Walter Mwambazi. I hope you guys watched that one, Pre-Adamic World Part 2. It was interesting. We learned a lot of stuff. Gave me a lot of study through the, uh, the festive season. Yeah. I hope you guys watch that one. So we're continuing with the Gifts of the Spirit series. Hope you guys are coughed up. <laughs> yeah. Continuing with the Gifts of the Spirit series and we have um a guest in studio today. So I told you guys that we'll be having pastors and men of God come into the studio to explain to us some of these gifts, um, both from a biblical and experiential point of view. And we had uh, Prophet Gomezio come in as the first man of God, I believe, on this series. And now today we have Apostle Frederick Kaluluma, pastor of City of the Lord Church, senior pastor of the City of the Lord Church, very uh, vibrant, charismatic, and uh, what other words can I use to describe him? We've had a long-standing relationship. You remember this? <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome on the show. You're welcome to the show. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> funny. <laughs> yeah, I do. That should have been... Um, 
early 2014 or early 2015? Yeah, somewhere 2014, 15. Yeah, yeah, I think 2015. We were, we were having like a, a review of the World Department movement the previous year. Exactly. Oh, yeah. you remember. remember <laughs> yes. And so uh, Apostle Frederick and I have had uh, a relationship that comes from way back. And we've had a lot of time of prayer and ministry together. As a matter of fact, I was the first guest at his church. Uh, yeah, that is one part of their history they may never, they can never rub off. <laughs> <laughs> I was doing a prophetic campaign, I remember. I don't remember what year it was, but um, I, I went to City of the Lord Probably Church. 2016. 2016, I believe. Yeah. yeah, prophetic campaigns are coming back next, this year, rather. Woo, soon 2023. Uh, yeah, prophetic campaigns are coming back 2024, and we'll be excited to give you guys details to those if you'll be interested in in attending them. Don't look at me like this, I can prophesy. Look at that. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome to the show, sir. Thank you so much. How have um, you been? I've been well. Uh, 2024 is a good year. Yeah? Yeah, and we've got some great plans for it. Yeah, I'm excited to see and attend those. I haven't attended the Dominion Conference. Yeah. I intended on <laughs> attending the one you had last year, but uh, circumstances beyond my control. Isn't that what they all say? <laughs> <laughs> Whether it is or not. <laughs> no, <laughs> really, really, year, really. Um, you have to attend this year. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah. I'll be there. Uh, hopefully, I'll be on the post. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm glad to have you here. Uh, last guest we had was Reverend Mambazi. Last man of God we had on the show was Reverend Mambazi for the Bible Talks. Uh, show so we do bible talks every friday we discuss a lot of stuff we've we've discussed parts of the gifts of the spirit today we're doing gifts of healings uh which for me from my you know uh, earlier days in christianity i remember my encounters learning about the gifts of the spirit particularly the gifts of healings from you it was interesting stuff um many may not know but apostle fred actually played uh, a mentor a mentor role in my in my in my in my early Christian. There's a lot of stuff I I imitated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I've never admitted that to him. But yeah, there's a, <laughs> a lot of stuff there's even to this day. Everything. Yeah, there's a first step. Even to this day, when I'm when I'm when I'm doing a lot of things, I still uh, probably do them the same way. Yeah, but I'm I'm really glad to have you on the show, and I'm looking forward to learning from you on 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 the gifts of the spirit. Thank you so much. Um, I'm honored to be here. Yeah. And we've done a lot of ministry together as well. Um, yeah. Uh, he's one of the people that I would, if I wanted someone who would like believe with me, you know, <laughs> I'm going to pray for someone, I would say, you know, let's get the heart done. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> I just never told you that. Oh, well. really? <laughs> <laughs> no, today is a day of confessions. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so to begin with, we're going to review a scripture in the book of Corinthians that we uh, began with on the gifts of the spirit. That would be 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I'll read from verse 1 to 9. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant you know that you were Gentiles carried away to these dumb idols, however you were led. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are, divers there are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one, for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the same, through the spirit. We did this one. To another is given the word of knowledge through the same spirit. We also did this one. To another, faith by the same spirit. And to another, the gifts of healings by the same spirit. So yeah, today we're discussing gifts of healings. We did word of wisdom. We talked about how word of wisdom is God giving you advice, giving you perspective from his perspective giving you insight into issues from his perspective we talked about word of knowledge being god sharing his knowledge with you and we also discussed how that god can perceive time uh better than we can and so he can take us back and forward into time and we interpret these as 
as gifts. So today we're discussing, we also discussed the gift of faith with Prophet Gomezio and he told us a lot of deep stuff about this gift. And so today we are discussing the gifts of healings and we want to find out why this is the first gift that is um, listed in a plural sense, gifts of healings and not just the gift of healing. So yeah, maybe you can start from there. That, and, that's a good place to start from. Yeah. Now that's because there are many. Okay. Um, the same way there are various sicknesses, you'll find um, by reason of use, some people can develop in terms of praying for those with stomach issues. Then you find others have developed in terms of praying for the blind. Yeah. And others have developed in terms of praying for the deaf. Yeah. So you'll find that the gifts, they're packaged, but they, they come as many. And through faith, you can unlock different aspects of them. Okay. Yeah. So... On a personal note, there are certain things that I would find easier to pray for. Yeah. Should I say to minister healing for? And there are others where I have to work my faith, especially where I have mental barriers. Yeah. Yeah. So um, the gifts are many that diverse. Okay. And you know, when you when you look at some of the revivals of the past, like Azusa, mm. you find in Azusa people they even had specialists. You know. <laughs> yeah. That one person who was so good at praying for those with teeth issues, another person mm. who was so good at praying for those who are deaf. And so mm. there are several and we can go in all of them. So the reason why it's put in a plural sense is because there are, you'd say each, each, each particular area of healing would be a gift on its own. Yes. And, um, there are many, it's a package and there are many, and maybe another side people may not know mm. is that, um, this is also where emotional healing comes in. Yeah. There are people who are so graced to heal the broken hearted. And yeah. That's a gift. Wait, can someone be healed of a broken heart by the laying on of hands? Yes, they can. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> um, you know, it's a very, it's an, it's an interesting topic because um, scripturally, there's no particularly one way in which people can be healed. Yeah. Uh, laying on of hands is the most common way, but others can be healed through the words through mm, words that are spoken mm, mm. and sometimes others are healed through the hem of the garment <laughs> yeah, yeah, or yeah. through just the presence of another person. Now, whereas from my experience, I have had encounters where someone has that one moment and perhaps it happens through the laying of hands yeah. where a healing happens or perhaps that's emotionally, like find a healing happens. Yeah. They're flooded with such joy. And then it's what we do from there because um, there's also now a need for the renewing of the mind. Mm. And if the mind is not renewed, some of the thoughts that are causing the heart to be a particular way can still be retained. Hence, a person going back to the way they were mm. the next day or the other day. Mm. However, laying on of hands is not the only way to minister healing to a broken heart. Mm. One of the ways is through consistent counsel, which may not always take one day. Mm. Also through intercession, also through... So would you also say that the gifts of healings are manifesting in... In if, if someone is healed through cancer that has taken two weeks, would you say that's another manifestation of the gifts of healings? You, you know, one amazing thing about the gift, before I answer that, is mm. that more often than not, someone may be using more than one gift at mm. the same time. Mm. So you'll find that um, just in the counseling of that person, the gift of prophecy might manifest, there might be a word of wisdom, mm. and even through their words, healing. Um, I come through. It says he sent his word and healed them. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, the gifts of healings can manifest even just through counseling, even if it's a year. It's mm. Still, it's still <laughs> healing that's yeah. happening. Yeah. Yeah. I once heard a a preacher say, you know, he was asked about why some people are prayed for and then they still die, and he asked, "Can you point at anyone Jesus prayed for?" Even those he raised from the dead, <laughs> they're not here today. And he was talking about how sometimes when you administer healing and someone dies two weeks later, maybe they were supposed to have died tomorrow uh -huh. and their life was <laughs> prolonged by that prayer. Yeah. I don't know what you think about that perspective. Um, to function in the gift of healings, mm. your mind has to be closed up to a certain degree. I understand mm. why he would say that because... Um, once you allow the mental barriers of, oh, but some people die, or but some people do this, even just your faith to pray for people who are not well won't, yeah. won't work. To be fair, there are some questions that will only be answered in eternity. Yeah. But I do agree <laughs> that in healing people who are prolonging um, their life here on earth, and there are some people whose lives have seemed prolonged, 
uh, some maybe by 10 years, yeah. some by 30, yeah. um, and perhaps some by five to 10 days. <laughs> but the point is, yeah, yeah. Um, there's no prayer that's a waste. There's no yeah. form of ministration to a person that's a waste. And so I think people do ask the wrong questions because <laughs> surely if they're asking him that, they should ask Jesus the same question. Yeah, yeah. They should yeah. ask where Lazarus is. <laughs> <laughs> Where is Lazarus? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting question. And uh, given that we know Jesus has the ability to keep someone alive permanently, I mean, he talked about John saying, yeah. if I want, he can be alive till I return. Yeah. So, so, so probably there is, there is a time frame attached to, to, to healing on this end of. Perhaps, but um, I wouldn't really put it like that. Yep. Maybe there's a time frame attached to being here on earth. Uh, mm. The person didn't have to be sick to die. Oh, yeah. They can just go. And mm. then <laughs> in addition, <laughs> perhaps there are more reasons rather than not being healed why people die. Some yeah. of the reasons could be destiny related. By the way, I know we're discussing gifts of healings, but I will, I think we'll go... Yeah, that, that's how our conversations hey. always go. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, know. But I, I think there's more than one reason why um, people die. Yeah. Others, their time may be done. Yeah. Others may have messed up destiny things. I, I, so do you, do you believe people actually die on the basis of uh, not going in line with their destiny? Is it possible for that to yeah. happen? Yes, I do think so. Okay. I do think that when you don't go in line with your destiny, um, you can lose a certain shield that mm. preserves. David uh, rightly quoted when he said, um, I will live and not die to declare the works of the Lord. So the living had a certain element of purpose mm. attached to it. Now, mm. Mm. so mm. that may not be the case for every person in the world who's died. To be fair, uh, death remains a mystery and mm. there are several cases where I have so many questions I would want to ask you right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there are several cases where you just don't know. But then um, destiny can also play a huge, like for f uh, doing purpose or not doing it, can play a huge part in people's lives. But okay. Yeah. Uh, by the way, speaking of death, yeah. what do you suppose when people die, they, they realize that... What I mean is, you know, there's, there's this, been this argument. I did a, a, an episode some, some couple of months ago where I talked about what happens after death. Uh -huh. And I had a lot of theological arguments from people on what they call the soul consciousness, or whether someone realizes uh -huh. that they are actually alive or rather whether someone is alive in another place. Uh -huh. Yes. Or whether they just sleep and will only wake up when Jesus comes. Okay, so I believe that a person remains conscious mm. even after they depart the earth. Mm. Um, we can see it from the scriptures. Uh, when Jesus talks about Lazarus and the rich man, mm. Jesus wouldn't... Firstly, the place that Jesus was describing was in heaven. Yeah, yeah. So he's not talking about the end of the age because that was Abraham's bosom. And we know it was in heaven because we don't see the throne room of God. And the Bible is very clear. After it talks about... Lazarus being on Lazarus' side, at Abraham's side, it says the rich man also died and was buried. Then the very next verse says, in hell, he looked up. So mm. uh, they were in the place of departed spirits, right? And it's very clear that the rich man was conscious of who he was, was conscious of where he was, and he was also conscious of where he used to be before, and mm. even conscious mm. of some of his relations before. That he has and left. Then Jesus mm. was asked the question once about you, the woman who uh, kept marrying brothers until she finished them. <laughs> until they, she finished. Like they were asking <laughs> yeah. whose wife will she be at the resurrection. Yeah. Jesus said at the resurrection will neither uh, will be like the angels. Mm. So you'll not be married or given into marriage. So you need to marry now. And then, <laughs> <laughs> they went to say, however, he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Yeah. And that was, and that's Jesus. He's like, these guys you're calling dead are actually dead in your realm. But, but in they are realm, alive, yeah. They are conscious and they're alive. And Jesus even had interactions. I mean, he had an interaction with Moses. Yeah, and and of course, it's yeah. an argument 
because Elijah did die on earth. But definitely oh, okay, was in okay, another okay, okay, realm. okay. So, so then, did him. Elijah actually go to heaven, or he went to the place of departure? I know that's a that, that that's quite a question. To yeah, be honest, on that one, I don't know. Um, yeah, if I was, I, I can't say with any authority really. I would mm. think uh, either he was flying somewhere, chilling. <laughs> <laughs> the chariots guy in days, like a thousand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like he's he just been. To, yeah, but I don't think I. I wouldn't think he went to heaven because mm. in Jesus's words, he says no one else has been to heaven been except there. the yeah. Son of Man. Would that mean that when Jesus died and went to 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 heaven, when he when he resurrected and went to heaven, did he somehow take? open the door, take the departed spirits with him to heaven, or did are they still in a place of departed spirits? I 100% believe that he took them with him. And um, for me, Hebrews 11 yeah. and 12 suggest that, because in Hebrews 11, we're given the, the war of faith. Yeah, yeah, faith, yeah, 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 yeah. The war of faith. Yeah. And then in chapter 12, we're immediately shown that these same people are now a cloud of great witnesses. Mm. And it says, now let us run on. Since we have such a cloud of great witnesses, let us run on with um, determination. And it's also interesting how Jesus was also like, you know, received into a cloud, right? Yeah. And then uh, when Paul is talking about where we've come to now, Mount Zion, the New Jerusalem, mm. he says to the spirits of just men made perfect. So mm. they were just before. And then the Lord Jesus has perfected them. Ah, so I, yeah. So actually, you know, interesting, you bring that scripture up. Yeah, I know we've digressed. So, but (laughs) (laughs) uh, interesting, you bring that up because I asked Reverend Mombazi a question when he was here about the angel that appeared to John in the revelation. Uh And John knelt down, wanting to bow down to the angel and say, no, 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 do not. I'm a a servant like you and I am of your brethren. Uh-huh. who have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now we know the scripture in the book of Peter also tells us that angels long to look into these things. So probably they do not understand the concept of the gospel. I don't think they do. From, from, yeah, so would that suggest that angels do not have the testimony of Jesus? Because Jesus died for human beings, right? Mm-hmm. Um, my my question to, to, to Reverend Mwambazi was, whether the, the, the person that appeared to John to explain what he explained was an angel in the sense of, you know, the angelos, the, the ones that God makes winds uh-huh. and ministering spirits unto the heirs of salvation. Or is this a spirit of just men made perfect being referred to as an angel because he's a messenger? Uh, I know that's a... <laughs> yeah, but the, the reason I'm bringing all these things up is because I, I believe... You know, I've had a lot of conversations with both believers and unbelievers recently about the age to come because uh-huh. God has uh, particularly been teaching me a lot about what it means, you know, the transitions from the Old Testament, how yeah. how how God was was kind of civilizing the the Israelites. He was teaching them, no, you treat your brother like this, you you treat, you know, he's uh-huh. he's he's teaching them how to how to live as a community. And then when Jesus Christ comes, you see almost a, there's a change in, in, in God's approach because Jesus begins to deal with a different kind of civilization now, not necessarily about our deeds, but about the state of our hearts. And then he promises an age to come where he talks about the great will be small, the small will be great. Uh-huh. And the Bible even goes as far as saying, uh, those that have tasted of the powers of the age to come, you know, and and I, I remember we had one word empowerment conference where we, it was dubbed, it was themed, uh, the new heaven, new Jerusalem. Yeah, the new Jerusalem. New Jerusalem. Yeah, yeah. and b- particularly before we we get to talking about the new Jerusalem, because I believe the new Jerusalem is an age after the age to come. Yeah. So now. Uh, there's a lot of stuff you've you, you've 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 talked about the cloud of witnesses and whatnot. Um, also, I'll, I'll somehow relate it to the gifts. When we transition to the age to come, I know that we'll have different bodies, uh-huh. and in this way, oh, I do, uh, by the way, I was talking about how I've talked to a lot of Christians, and uh, many of them do not understand the. You see, when people perceive heaven, they think of it as one big room. 
Mm-hmm. You know, one big white room where we'll be wearing white robes and worshiping God 24-7 for the rest of our lives exactly. or, or for eternity. But they do not perceive heaven or even the age to come as an actual life. For example, I was talking to a mother and I was telling her, you know, get your life in order because we need to be ready to meet the Lord. And she said, Ish, I wish it, I hope it doesn't come soon because I want my child to grow. So then I asked, why do you think your child won't grow if Jesus comes? So for me, my, my present understanding is that when we get into the age to come, it's not necessarily an interruption of our lives. Our lives will continue only that the world will be different. It's an upgrade. It's an, yeah, it's an upgrade. So now that makes me wonder whether these people that have gone before us who are dead have already, um, been exposed to the knowledge uh, of of things to come, uh-huh. and also whether God has, whether God would send them in the capacity of a messenger like He did with, with 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 John. So my question stems from there: Was John talking to an angel, or was he talking to the spirits of just men uh, made perfect? Given that he said, "I hold the testimony of Jesus," that was a long question. Oh my goodness! <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, I've never thought beyond an angel yeah with your god strong but you've given me something to study okay <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's an interesting answer <laughs> and with regards to the gift i asked prophet gomezio this question as well yeah. when when you talk about the gifts of the spirit i know in the old testament they had similar manifestations where the elishas of this world the elijahs would heal the sick would they were not referred to as the gifts of the spirit uh-huh. We've seen these abilities in this age and they're referred to as the gifts of the spirit. But in the age to come, the Bible talks about powers of the age to come. Are these the same powers? I I do think that uh, the key there is tasting of the powers of the age to come. So I do think that in the age to come, um, some of the things right now that we consider advanced Mm. will be very normal. There'll be a very, uh, it, it's, for me, when I think about the age to come, I think about it like technology. If you went back to the 1950s mm. right now with all the knowledge you have mm. or the equipment you have, wow. Imagine <laughs> with all the knowledge of the past that you have, you went back to the 1950s. There are certain, you would be able to position yourself a particular way and perhaps you would be able to have access to certain things other people don't have access to. Yeah. So I do believe that um, when you're walking in these graces, you're really walking at a, at a more advanced level. Mm. Now, in the age to come, then probably won't, there won't be need for healing, right? Mm-hmm. But then perhaps what we're really tapping into is the life that we're going to walk in. Because the reason there won't be need for healing is because everyone will just be walking in life. They'll be walking in um, it will be beyond health. It will be life. Mm. It's life over and over and over and over and over and over. While we get to experience and see the full reality of this eternal life that Jesus came to give us. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Okay. But will there be a distinction between those that would have uh, gone to heaven prior to, to Christ coming back? I mean, when we talk about the age to come, I believe that there's a, a rapture we're expecting. Yeah. And then Christ comes back with 10,000 of his, thousands upon thousands of his saints yeah. that had been raptured. Uh-huh. In that, are we going to live in that new world with people that had not been raptured? Uh, or, or, you know, and people that had been raptured. I mean, are we going to live with people? Are we going to have two different groups of people? Those with new bodies <laughs> <laughs> and the old ones. Yeah. And maybe those would need healing. That's a very good way of putting it. Um, to be honest, a lot about some of those days are a bit mysterious. Mm. Right? Um, a part of me, I love to know everything I need to know. Yeah, I yeah, yeah. Do. yeah. But a part of me likes that I'm not 100% sure about it. <laughs> you know, I think this has always been a distinction between you and I somehow. Yeah. And, and I, I remember we got into a lot of debates back in the day because I am kind of I'm very curious. You want to know everything. Yes. And I'm then probably, I want to know. Okay, so Jesus like shocked me. So like, are you sending me off to that planet? Yeah, but yeah. John yeah. did 
say it's not yet maybe to them that is just mm. for to, in John's time it wasn't yet fully uh, revealed what mm. was what was going to be in time to come. But I do think that even as we're getting closer, we're getting more and more insight. You know, yeah, we're yeah. More the and more the, the, know, the knowledge is increasing. You know, there is something I was studying recently. Yeah, crazy. Yeah, but you know, I don't know whether whether the whether some things we learn can actually even be taught. Yeah, <laughs> like the apostle Paul. Yeah, he's yeah. Spread. There are some things that he was exposed to, which he said were not permitted. Exactly. So it's it's crazy. I was reading a scripture in Genesis because I uh, late last year I began a, a my journey with the scriptures again from the beginning and. So I was reading a scripture in Genesis after God made the heaven and the earth, the heavens and the earth and he talked about these are the generations of heaven and these are the generations of the generations of heaven and earth. It was an interesting scripture because the word generation there when you read it from the original Hebrew talks about lineage. Uh-huh. So there's a lineage of heaven and earth. And it it, it sparked my interest but but anyway it was a <laughs> <laughs> Clearly yeah. you've not changed. Gifts of healings yeah. <laughs> By the way, if you're not subscribed, please subscribe. Uh, Hit that bell and share. Yeah. So, gift of healings. <laughs> talk to me. What has what was your first experience with the gifts of healings, and how did you realize that you could? I was first exposed to the knowledge of it. Uh, Twenty zero. Um, I knew people would heal the sick. By the way, because I grew up in a church that permitted that. Yeah. And taught that. So like I grew up in Zauga for in faith. Yeah. And then also how my mom got saved is that she got healed while watching a Benny crusade online. Mm. So Pastor Benny called out a word of knowledge for someone who had a challenge with their eye. Oh, really? She had a challenge with her eye. So when she got healed, she decided she was going to, uh, show, uh, she used to be Catholic then. She decided she would find a church that perhaps promotes such things. So that's mm. what we say is older. So were you Catholic I, when you were much, I, much more younger? I have no memory of it. <laughs> if I ever went, I have no memory. The Lord has blotted it out. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> I don't remember going to, because my dad used to go to church periodically. Yeah. And you'd go to Dutch Reformed. Dutch Reformed. Do we still have Dutch yeah, Reformed? I think they're called uh, RCZ. I think that's Oh, similar. RCZ. Okay. So my dad okay. would go there. And then for mm. Catholic, my only memory is of going there, maybe going for the fete. <laughs> and stuff. I don't think yeah. my mom was really going to church. I think she was Catholic by name by then. Okay. I don't think she was at that point. I don't think she was going to church consistently. Okay. So by then I was five, and then that's why I stayed going to church at the age of five. I now there's so that's why now I have memories of you know Sunday school and, mm-hmm. that, and I would even preach mm. uh, from around that period. Then when I was around 14 years old, I stayed now discovering God for myself because around 14 is when I got saved. I was on a bus one day and I heard God speaking to me. Yeah. And that's how I got saved. And I stayed going to church more often because at that time I'd stopped. Mm. And um, I met a man called Pastor Emmanuel Mulele. Yeah. And he told my mom saying he's having an overnight where he's going to be teaching on the spirit and the overnight was called school of the spirit still mm, mm. and then when we went they were just telling us about the gifts and you know there's something about knowledge mm. knowledge does something to you there are certain realms that you only be exposed to when you know about them mm. no wonder we are told that war to the teachers of the law because they've taken away the key of knowledge and it says you did not enter in and you're not allowing others to enter mm. so many people have forfeited certain realms because they're not taught Mm. So they then it then like registered in my spirit that you can be gifted to heal, mm. and so now um, at that time I'm about fourteen. When I was about sixteen, one of our members at church got unwell. Yeah, and so we went to the hospital to just go see them. And so when I went there, I was my gap year by then. The moment I entered the hospital, everything in me did a somersault. I felt like I was fine. <laughs> yeah, and that's how I stopped two random people and prayed for them. And yeah. Uh, that's how I, I was in my gap year then. I mm. began to frequent the hospitals and I would maybe make friends. Uh, low cost was easier to pray for people. Yeah. Because you would just pray for one and the rest would say, what about me? Mm. And then they were very accepting of. Yeah. Of, mm. In high cost, I would usually look for someone lonely. Mm. Never refuse, especially if I accepted to sing for them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, do you still uh, sing, play guitar? 
I we, still we, we have a guitar there. Really? <laughs> I still play guitar. I play the keyboard. I sing. Ah, okay. Yeah. Okay. And then, um, so that's what happened. And then I can say when I began to have meetings, mm. it started cementing because the boldness, I suddenly had boldness, I had courage to pray for the sick uh, publicly. Mm. And that's something that I had noticed wasn't really done. And with no disrespect to yeah. the wonderful uh, churches that are out there, yeah, I would go to a lot of places where they would talk about healing, and share testimonies about healing that happened somewhere else, or even through them. But I never really saw like someone say, "Come here, mm. I'm going to pray mm. for you now," and you get healed. And you get healed now. now. Um, I would respect any person who does that, even if the person maybe doesn't physically get healed immediately. Mm. The boldness to do that is maybe at that time what separated me from a lot of other people because I had just read the word and I genuinely believed it. And so I gained this thirst and the conferences weren't enough. So I stayed in the healing campaign mm. and I think I did two or three where people would give us their details and would follow them at mm. our cost, not theirs. Mm. One of the saddest things is obviously some people say, um, how much does it charge? <laughs> oh, yeah. Actually, I I remember the healing uh, campaigns you used to do. That yeah. did give birth to my prophetic campaigns. Wow. Yeah, because I, I told you, I replicated everything he did. So <laughs> <laughs> I've always wanted to do another one. I just don't know how I'll do it now because if, I think what I would have to do is maybe with a team. Yeah. So that I send the teams also because if I'm to just post today and say healing campaign, I don't know how many requests I'll get per day. Oh yeah. Yeah. But um but usually around Easter period, I like having a healing meeting. Okay. I did that last year. We saw some crazy miracles. Yeah. And I, I'll probably do that uh this year in 2024 as well. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so the healing campaigns came and also I'll just invite myself to people's homes. So I noticed that the more I exercise the gifts. Mm-hmm the more they grew. I like that. Invite myself to people's homes. <laughs> yeah. And then they'll grow. Yeah. And then they'll spread. And then um, as time went by, I started being recognized as one of those who was genuinely flowing in that healing ministry. So that's that's my beginning of my relationship with it. I have had some encounters with God that have taken it to the next level. Mm. There was one I had when I was 16 while I was walking in the road yeah. in a dream. Mm. And there was a person who was blind and I prayed for them and they got healed. Mm. Just that one dream mm. took me. Oh, really? Yeah, it took me. And I kept praying for people and I prayed for someone who was blind. Mm. I kept looking for them. And then there was one that I had which has had the biggest impact on me in the healing ministry. I was reading a book, um, Healing Evangelists by Robert Leonard. Mm. And... As I was reading, I was just getting impacted and impacted. So when I reached one person's story, I didn't yet reach their end and I didn't Google them. So I didn't even know whether they were alive or not alive. And um, I had an encounter that perhaps uh, I can say it's one of those that's maybe my one of my most controversial encounters. Yeah. Because I was lying down in bed mm. and I knew the Lord Jesus had walked in. Mm. He was right there. And he said... Sickness is never my will. Mm. Those were his exact words. To me. Mm. And he says, it's never my will. And then he then said to me, when you continue reading this book, you'll notice how this person died and they got sick. Mm. He's like, not even that was my will. And he left. Mm. And I was in the middle of a healing campaign. The next day, I went to pray for a woman who had like this huge cancer on the breast. And yeah. the lamp was there. Yeah. And it was like at a military place. So, you know, they sent military cars to come pick me up. Yeah. Because it was a very top person. Yeah. And they took me there and I laid hands and things started shrinking. It wasn't completely shrunk, but it like said shrinking and shrinking. It was such a deposit of power. Mm. And yeah, so I've, um, I, I walk with that uh, mindset that mm. it's never as well. And mm. that the righteousness of God in a situation where there's sickness is to bring healing. So does that mean your expectation for every sick person you pray for is that they will be healed? Yes, I actually expect every sick person in the world right now to be healed. <laughs> nice. And I mean it. Mm. Sometimes I Google up photos of the worst sicknesses mm. and I start talking to them. What's the worst? 
case you've had to deal with in terms of sickness? Okay, let me tell you one. There was one which I think you were present as well. Mm -hmm. There was a case we had where a woman texted me and said, uh, she, wants, she texted me on Facebook and said, I really need to be healed. I've got this, I've got that, I've got that. And I'll get into the details shortly. Yeah. I was like a bit busy. So I replied, just come for when. Yeah. So I didn't know she was admitted in hospital. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how she found her way out, but, uh, and I'm not saying people should check themselves. <laughs> I don't know what she did. Yeah. And before I knew it, she was at WEM, I was at Nyumbayanga conference and she couldn't swallow. Mm -hmm. It was closed on her throat and her liver was failing her kidneys were failing, her body was frail. It was mm. absolutely frail. She looked like you could blow and, <laughs> and she would fall. <laughs> mm. And then um I administered healing and deliverance to her along with some of the other ministers. Mm. And then uh she then came to see me a few months later to tell me what had happened. And so she explained that she was at HIV stage three or four. Mm -hmm. I don't. I didn't even know there were stages of HIV. Mm. That's why everything was dying. And from that day, her throat opened. Mm. Um, the the doctors couldn't find the HIV, mm. and then everything started functioning again. That was about uh, that should have been 2015. So since we're in 2024, that's like nine years ago. And the last time I met her was 2023. We met in a shop. She looks well. Mm. She's gained. She's always telling me I need to come testify at your church. Yeah. Uh, the doctors themselves, she always goes back for checkups. Mm. It's where with HIV, people always have to constantly go back. As it stands, they've not allowed her to be on medication for the past few years because they don't see a need. Wow. That's wow. That's one of the craziest. I've wow. Seen. Yeah. And That's life, life changing, that life trans. Yeah. As I can tell you one more. And as time went by, I stopped really looking at this is a bigger healing than another. Mm -hmm. I think what touches you more is the impact on a person's life. You know, mm -hmm. I was in Livingston at the end of 2023 in December mm -hmm. and I preached a crazy message. Um, my messages usually get me into trouble. Yeah. I preach those messages which make people bring those cases to me. You know? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I preached a crazy message and then, um, uh, I, I then had a word of knowledge and I knew that there was a person in the room whose right ear wasn't working completely. So I said, somebody here, one of your ears doesn't work completely. And this lady comes to the front, she's 23. And then she couldn't hear on the right ear completely since the age of six because she was beaten. Mm. Uh, she was beaten up. Right? Really? Yeah, I think that maybe blocked her eardrum or something like that, or maybe damaged it. Mm. And we prayed. The smile on her face, I can still see it today. Like the <laughs> smile on her face when she could hear. So I've honestly seen hundreds. Mm. I'm not yet sure if I've seen thousands, but I've seen hundreds. I guess this also does a lot of, it does a lot to what someone believes about Jesus in terms of, I believe many Christians have been through a phase where yeah. they're asking God to become real to them yeah. because a lot of Christians have understood the theoretical side of the gospel. Uh, Jesus once said to uh, the Pharisees, I believe, you search the scriptures because in them you believe you'll find life when the scriptures talk about me. Yeah. And I believe many people have not gotten to that place where they actually encounter the God that the scriptures talk about. Exactly. And so they are still at the place where they are, they are looking for God in the scriptures. And I believe healing is one of those ways that make God real in the moment. You know, yeah. the fact that it can really change the, traje the, the tra trajectory of your life. Imagine. If someone was told you're going to die, yeah. there's a lot that's organized. I remember attending a funeral. It wasn't a funeral yet, actually. The person hadn't died yet, but they were in their final stages of life. They eventually died. But people gathered at the house. They started the funeral while the person was still alive. Yeah. And I mean, it's almost obvious in some cases when someone is sick that ah, this one is not going to be with us for long. And so people begin to organize. Just recently, I, I, I had an acquaintance who had a send-off party for their father. Their father isn't well, so they did a send-off party. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's 
very um, African. <laughs> I know. They they had a party saying, oh, I, we believe this might be the last the last time we are, we are we are sitting down like this with him. I was actually very shocked. Like, oh, that's interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but imagine what a healing would do for all those who gathered expecting this person to die. Yeah. I believe healing, healing is yeah. It gives people their life back. It gives them an opportunity to do destiny again. Mm. That's what I love about it most. Mm. That's interesting. There's a scripture I want to uh, read to you that I once heard you read during one of the house visits. Um, Acts 10, 38. Uh How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. For God was with him. Now, uh, the the time you explained this scripture, uh, by the way, it became my template for <laughs> every house visit. I had a phase where I visited uh, the sick in hospital, yeah. and I had a phase when I I, I I visited homes. Many times, I did the prophetic campaign. When I, whenever I went to homes, we also had to deal with a yeah with a with a healing case. I don't think I had the boldness you had okay. <laughs> with healing because you know there are some cases where you see someone sick. You first want to search for God in your heart <laughs> through a worship song. <laughs> uh, when the first worship song finishes and you have not found, <laughs> you go to the next and the next. So yeah, this became a template. But the interesting part about this scripture, it talks about how God anointed Jesus uh, with the Holy Spirit and with power. And he went about healing all who were oppressed of the devil. Now, mostly when we talk about demonic oppression, especially in the context of 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 demons oppressing individuals or oppressing may it may be Christians or unbelievers, we talk about it in the context of inf- influence. Uh-huh. I know demons can oppress with sickness; they can oppress with all manner of things. But we mainly talk about it in the in terms of influence, like oh, this demon is causing someone to drink, and yeah. this demon is causing someone to <laughs> you know. Yeah. We we talk about it in that context mostly, and also. Uh, when we talk about demonic oppression, we believe the best way to deal with it is by casting out demons. Mm-hmm. Now, if Jesus healed demonic oppressions, would this include the times he cast out demons? When you read in the scriptures, especially when you read Matthew's gospel, yeah. you read Mark and the like, the scriptures are very clear. They would say he brought, they brought to him all those with infirmities and those who were oppressed by devils. Mm. They would say he healed them. Mm. Now, I actually believe that the ministry of deliverance is part of the ministry of healing. Mm. Um, if you've noticed on the gifts given, you won't necessarily see the gift of deliverance. <laughs> no, you won't. <laughs> yeah, but I believe the, there are so many, there's so much scripture evidence to show that uh, deliverance is part of healing. Mm. Now, um, how the demons were cast out mainly were through words because that's usually how demons are dealt with. And I do believe that healing in itself, when you look at how Jesus did it, there are times he would talk. Mm. There are times he would talk to the body. Sometimes he would talk to the spirit. Sometimes mm. he would lay his hands. So I, I think our focus shouldn't really be on whether a person casts out through talking or their hand shakes and it leaves. <laughs> but the fact is that mm. a lot of uh, sicknesses that need for a demon spirit to be rebuked first mm. for the sickness to also go. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, so for, oh, that's interesting. That's, that's very interesting. So is that why some people don't seem to get the result? Yes. When they lay their hand and is it, is it because they haven't spoken to the cause? They have to. Um, you observe that there's that little boy who was brought to Jesus. Yeah. Jesus even asked the case history, asked what the demon does. And, mm-hmm. the light, and then, you know, he rebuked <laughs> the spirit and the boy was healed. We also see a very interesting case in the book of Luke where there's a woman who was bent over. Yeah. Probably in today's world would say it was a scoliosis of some sort. Mm-hmm. And what we find interesting is that when Jesus was asked, he said, because he healed her on the Sabbath, Mm. He said, ought not this woman whom Satan has bound think about it for mm. 18 years? Those are his exact words. Mm. Meaning, the day the oppression started, 
there was a there was a particular day, a particular moment. It can be traced to yeah. it, it has a, a beginning. It had a root. Mm. And you notice that Jesus dealt with the root. So um there are some cases now you can imagine she was going to the hospital and perhaps her case was just like everybody else's case but maybe other people are seeing improvements and she wasn't so there was a devil so this me- brings me to the question there are some people that get sick go to the hospital are given medication and they recover yeah could any of those diseases have been caused by demons it is possible um let me also just mention that first i love doctors mm and doctors being an umbrella word for everybody really who under the medical and the, i love the medical uh the medical facilities the medical wing mm. when god was teaching israel he did provide for that i actually mm. believe it's a very priestly duty mm. and if you had to ask me medicine is a manifestation of the wisdom of god mm. and who says the wisdom of god can deal with an oppression that was brought by a devil yeah yeah but then there are some Honestly, when you read from the scriptures, there are some demons that are more stubborn than others. There are some demons that may refuse to listen to the pattern. <laughs> <laughs> there are some uneducated ones. You know? <laughs> the sons of Skeva yeah. kept casting out demons. <laughs> they even had a ministry. According to the scriptures, they were doing itinerary ministry. Oh. If you amplify it, they were doing, they were going about probably even making money out of it. Okay. Then they met some uneducated demons. So yeah. They're like, wait, <laughs> before we go. <laughs> who are you? <laughs> who are you? Yeah. But now, can you imagine if we've got doctors who are anointed and full of the Holy Ghost and maybe everyone in the medical uh, profession mm. such that even as they are saying, okay, I'm giving you this and you'll be better. The power in their words is entering that panadol. Right? The, the pharmacist lays hands on all lays the hands. pills. Like and they... <laughs> would have a revolution. Yeah. And interesting, I have cases sometimes where someone comes to see me and I'll call someone from the medical wing. Like mm. I'll ask, I, I've just been told this. Uh, tell me more about this. And I, I, I have had cases where I've told them, you go to the hospital. Right? Yeah. This just needs a drink of this. Mm. And on the flip side, I've also had cases where I've had people from the medical side bringing people to my meetings. Oh really? Yeah, bringing people to my meeting. Yeah, there's a woman who was deaf. HPZZ might not be too amused with that, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> there was a woman who was deaf in both ears. And the oh really? Brought her to my place during the healing campaign, saying, "You need, you you need to be prayed for." It's amazing what medical people get to witness and what they get to to acknowledge eventually. Yeah. For example, I have heard a lot of medical people talk about, you know, those who initially did not believe that um, people live on after they die. Uh-huh. What they've witnessed when they see people die uh-huh. on their deathbeds has, has shown them otherwise. As well as, as you say, they have also begun to realize that there is, there is a greater power for healing. And I think sometimes it's because uh, why there's been this like rivalry. Mm. Or one the same thing is also because of how the people on the preaching side have treated medical doctors sometimes. Yeah. I mean, if or if in your sermons you keep preaching that doctor is a liar, how yeah. you, <laughs> someone who didn't study seven years and do all that practice just to become a liar. Mm. They diagnose mm. the fact. So I I don't think we should be calling doctors liars and all sorts of names. And I've talked to them, they've told me of cases where maybe a pastor's gone there and maybe like forced one of, someone to be off oxygen or something mm. and or told them to buy an anointing oil for three pin when they're in their deathbed so those kind of things sometimes have contributed to them seeing healing ministers a particular way mm. but when you respect them they respect you mm. they will even be the ones allowing you beyond visiting now <laughs> okay okay that's interesting yeah you know speaking of mm, speaking of how we can uh view and speak more wisely about the medical field. I actually, in my view, think I'll, I'll take you back to the age to come. <laughs> I actually do think when God is restoring, because Jesus says at the restoration of all things, when he talks about, you know, when he returns, I believe God might do what he did with Moses, where he appoints elders and uh, Moses to begin to deal with issues we might work in the, in a similar capacity as doctors did to heal the masses anyway that's my belief 
<laughs> You've got an interesting mind. Maybe that's why you're sure. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing minds. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. One day I actually want to have a segment where we'll have you and Pastor Daniel in studio. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, one of you will take that seat, the other will take the seat. And I would like us to discuss finding God beyond the scriptures. I know that sounds controversial, <laughs> but I believe that. Do you, do you think in the same way that you said medicine is, God, is an element of God's wisdom? Yeah. Do you believe if we studied creation, nature, we can begin to learn certain things about God? You, you know the book of Romans. Uh-huh. tells us about how God has revealed himself uh-huh. through nature that no man can have an excuse. Uh-huh. And recently I've been taking a lot of study in different fields, be it physics, be it, and I've just begun to see how the Bible has explained a lot of this stuff. Yeah. And people are just not aware because firstly, uh, many people that have gotten to teach the gospel have shunned all other fields of knowledge. So, if you ask them, for example, how you can find God in, in, in the heavenlies or you can find God in nature, most people have not actually taken time to study, you know, these other fields to be, to be able to relate them to the scripture. So I think that would be an interesting, an interesting conversation. <laughs> be an interesting discussion. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> maybe not be empty, it would be interesting. Exactly. I know you've had a very, um, I think amongst us have been the most, one of the most rigid, right? Yeah, you've had a very reserved view, you know, like um, when we talk about studying other books that are mentioned in the Bible itself, I, I don't know what your take would be on that. I was reading, the, is it the Chronicles of the Kings that said, oh, if you want to read more about this king, it's documented in the book of Joshua. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I know there are, there are, there are such, uh, there are such books of knowledge and I don't know what your perspective would be on getting to study wide uh-huh. that uh, even to the extent of going beyond the Bible uh-huh. to be able to know certain things about God or whether I know the Bible is our foundation, uh-huh. but is it our ceiling? Uh-huh. Okay. So I think I can leave that for that discussion. So that <laughs> we, That's we interesting. Have, we have a good time because we've had some debates over the years, mm. um, on a personal note, I'm quite reserved. Uh, I'm quite like I'm very, I'm very comfortable with the sixty-six. <laughs> <laughs> why though? Could you could you I, I, could you give me some insight into why? I've not had, um, I've not had any inspiration beyond it. Mm. Beyond them, um, I feel like uh, a lot of people I've met who. I'm always looking for something else. I found some of them to be too controversial for no reason. And I found some of them to easily get corrupted because mm. not everything out there is is good. Mm. And I'm not saying not everything out there is bad, but I found some of them to be very... Um, I found some of them to not necessarily have a, a Christian standing that I look up to. So I've not, mm. Mm. I've not felt... Any, yeah, they're prone to... Era. Yeah, I've not felt any need to be overly inspired. And then um, I would like them to explain the 66 to me first properly. And, yeah. Okay. Do, do you know what I, I would say? As someone who has at least read the 66 yeah. more than once, I believe we need a foundation, a, a very strong foundation. You know, the Bible in the book of Psalms says, if the foundation be destroyed, what would the righteous do? I believe we need a very strong foundation on the 66 books. But there's a part of me that also believes there are certain aspects of the 66 books that would be better understood if we have, let's say, historical context. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, 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 was, I was learning recently that at the time that Jesus Christ began his ministry, the political climate in Israel, I was, I was recently studying about that. And, yeah, why, that as well. yeah, and why the disciples actually, why some of the disciples joined him and believed in his political assignment at the time. So... I believe getting into a historical context better makes the scriptures real. I agree with you. To us. And sometimes that historical context is found outside of the scriptures. 
look at yeah. that. No, I agree with you about historical context and all those things, political climate, economic climate, and, mm, mm, mm. and all that. I, I do agree. I do I do believe there were books Paul was reading. There were things that were helping him understand certain things better. Yeah. yeah. So I do agree with you on that. Yeah. All right. So anyway, uh, <laughs> I like how, you know, there's something both you and Prophet Gomezio have done. Uh, you have very wisely and calmly um, addressed these these questions. Like, <laughs> like oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I hear you. Yeah. No, 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 that that doesn't make sense. Yeah. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> <laughs> How's your mom, by the way? You you talked about your mom. It's 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 been a while. She's doing well. She's doing well. Yeah, she's in her fifties now. Oh, really? Uh, she's of late. She's doing a lot of gardening. Yeah. Not like at a low level, like uh, professional gardening. Oh, like big time gardening. Yeah. Ah, okay. She's enjoying herself. I met Alice at the the last meeting pastor daniel had the night of thanksgiving yeah, yeah we had a good chat okay, it's it, it, it had been a while it had been eh? it had been a while as well how's your your relationship with her singing ministry now i know a lot of times back then when when she was still she was actively involved in the in the music ministry in your meetings uh, that do you still have her come over yeah, she's at dominion every year oh yeah <laughs> oh, okay. I need to attend Dominion this year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, every okay. Yeah. And how is uh, your, generally, how do you assess the ministry in Zambia? How do you assess ministry in Zambia? Uh, I've been looking a lot at, at what has been going on in the church circles globally. Um, in my view, there is a lot of um, what I would call sects. Uh -huh. Yes. How do you see ministry in Zambia? Is it is it changing? Is it as it was back back then when you first started? Um, the community of of there are more of, young of, people who are prominent now. Yeah. In terms of you know back in the day you would hear somebody say things like oh I've never ah, these are the young people we need we've never seen young people do this keep it up <laughs> and now there's some things young people would do and be like oh has this ever been done before mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah so I and um. I can't really, um, it's something that perhaps I want to be, I want to improve on, maybe, you know, um, know a few more people. Yeah. But I'm very, I've been quite focused on what I've been doing. But from the people that I interact with, uh, especially the, maybe the, the younger in age ministers, mm -hmm. maybe like 35 and below, I've noticed a lot of us who may be as seen as the prominent ones have known each other for some time. So. We mm -hmm. honestly get along and we have a lot of discussions privately that maybe just don't make it to the public. Mm. And then there are others who I would say I've not yet gotten to build relationships with or gotten to know properly. And um, it's interesting to see what's going on. A number of them are influenced by Spare the Move in Nigeria. Mm. Um, I think there was a period where a lot were influenced by maybe the West. Mm. But it's even more the influence is now. It's, it's coming. It's coming back to Africa. Yeah. So would you say this general? I I don't use the word division, but I, I, f from what I've observed, especially for the more international preachers out there, those I mean who are being followed by millions, they, you can clearly see a divide between uh -huh. I would say maybe a prophetic movement and an apostolic movement. I'm asking you this also because you are uh, an apostle. Yeah. And would you say this has trickled down to our Zambian ministries? Is there this division between the prophetic ministries and the apostolic ministries? Or is Zambia a bit more on the united side of things, ministry-wise? I think we're more on the, um, for this, for the phase now, uh, at this point, I'm speaking more of the ministers, maybe 35 and below. Yeah. We're well, more on the establishing side. Uh, it will take some time for us to see clearly which ones are the prophetic ministers, <laughs> which ones are the apostolic ministers. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of people tied on themselves. So, oh, yeah, that's true. Uh, yeah, but don't you think this division almost be, almost begins at inception? Because if you, if you really notice the more established uh, ministers who would show this level of division, it, I think you can trace it to. Yeah, there was a period where you could clearly see it, but a lot of those, especially who were considered the prophetic ministers, from my observation, 
the ministries didn't really last. So yeah, they didn't last long enough for us to see whether they're united <laughs> or divided. What is two, three years, their names would be gone. What, why? What happened? What caused that? I, I think the prophetic ministry is very needed. It came with a lot of persecution. And whether it was a reaction to it or not, but a number of the prophetic ministers became very arrogant. Mm. That's not healthy. Zambia, you know, sometimes people try to treat Zambia like it's another country. Mm. Zambia has got a way it works. And if you want to last, <laughs> there are certain things you must have. Some of it is respect for elders, well, where a country that considers such things. Mm. And another thing is just, just be decent in the way you do things. There was a lot of pressure that people felt that if you are thriving in the prophetic ministry, it will be seen by how many numbers or names you call out. But beyond that, it will mm. be seen by the cars you're driving, mm. the money you have, mm. and how light your wife is. <laughs> That's the way it was being seen. Wow. Now, the challenge is some of them didn't How have light money. your wife is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Some of them didn't have, and also how many countries you go to. Yeah. Now, some of them genuinely God use them like that, and they even have money. <laughs> and yeah. Married yeah. well and this and that. But then there are a lot that I met who were now in debt because they were trying to keep up an appearance that they are thriving in the prophetic ministry. And unfortunately, what is considered thriving in the prophetic ministry might actually be being in the desert eating locusts. Yeah. yeah. And only giving yeah. one prophecy that. Yeah. You know, that Jesus is th- that's very true. What you say if you really begin to trace the prophetic ministry, especially in the Old Testament, yeah. there are these prophets like, I, I particularly have a lot of interest in, in Ezekiel's prophetic ministry. And you know, there were times that he disappeared from the scene for 12 yeah. years. Yeah. Yeah. He would actually disappear 15 years. He's he's not on the scene. And then he comes back with, with another vision or, and there were two particularly separate periods of his ministry. I think this happened with Daniel as well. Yeah. The, many prophets did not have I understand the role may be a bit different between the Old Testament prophet and the New Testament prophet, but I think what you say is a very valid point. How that, you know, like, I just mm, think we just need to stop playing games. You know, like, yeah, this is so beautiful and authentic. Yeah, and you know, prophetic can mean a lot to people. I think we shouldn't say things that we know we can do. <laughs> no, when you come to my meeting, you just look at my face. I'll prophesy. <laughs> I mean, we'll come and look at your face. <laughs> yeah. So there was this expectation created, and unfortunately, it created an imbalance. People began to feel like if their name is not called out in a meeting, it wasn't their meeting. That's why you find a lot of people in the prophetic churches who change churches once the words of knowledge have run out. About mm, them. Mm. And I do believe that that's why a number of the prophetic churches perhaps didn't thrive. Mm. And... um. I am hopeful that we see, to be honest, I don't like the way the word prophet is seen. Yeah. If someone now introduces themselves as prophet, it's like in your mind, you already have. You switch off. Yeah, you put a yeah, stereotype yeah. of what you think they are, what you mm. think they're like, and, and the like. And it happens also with the phrase, the phrase apostle. Mm. But then I do think that uh, we need the prophetic ministry and we shouldn't castigated and then for those who are in the prophetic ministry i do think that there's just need for more humility it's a very and maybe just for them to to, to know their kpis like what are their real key performance indicators is it mm, mm, the car mm, you drive oh you had to get academic yeah <laughs> is, it, is it really the car you drive and the light wife yeah or is it um the fact that you're helping people discover more of god because prophets god naturally gives them a sense of adventure and if they're genuine prophets, they'll want everyone to discover these realms that God is leading them to. Once we have that in order, then I think there'll be a, there'll be a lot of great things. Otherwise, I do think that in Zambia, we may not appear as united. Uh, I think maybe we also need to define what unity is. Does mm. unity mean I should post everyone, mm-hmm. attend everyone's meeting, mm. or completely agree with everyone? <laughs> But I do think we're better off than other places. Oh my God! Some of the stuff I see in other places, mm. they will go on. They will go on stage and literally call out, "Hey, Pastor Wood, hey, yeah, Pastor that one, that, that, actually, that. they will actually say, "No, this one is false." Fifteen minutes of the sermon, yeah. and I don't think I've seen that with Zambia. Mm. Generally, I do think there's some level of mutual respect, and then those who people, you don't understand, usually we just avoid each other. <laughs> yeah. Do, do you know there is uh, something that I personally perceive? 
uh, is, is happening within the body of Christ globally and where we are going to. Uh, go- the, I perceive that we are going into a very prophetic time in the, in the church globally, and we are going, to, and the knowledge of God is increasing as well. So we are going to have to break certain barriers of our own perceptions. Um, that would mean, you know, my, my general approach towards, let's say, new knowledge would be that I do not have a false first approach. And I believe a lot of people are not accepting of new knowledge. You know, people love to guard knowledge because usually their knowledge and their Christianity is built on particular pillars. Mm-hmm. So you don't want to break one of those pillars lest you, you, you yeah, shake. I hear you, but yeah, I do think that foundations are foundations. So mm-hmm. for example, you find, and there's this thirst to be controversial, <laughs> which I dislike. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So somebody will come up and say, oh, do you know that uh, sex before marriage is not a sin? Mm. I won't listen to anything else you have to say. Mm. You say that. I may, uh, are you actually referring to a scenario like that? I think there was that, one. Yeah. One of my, one of our members sent that to me and asked me. I didn't go beyond that line. You, you know the interesting thing about me, that particular... That's yeah, it. I can't listen. You know the particular the the funny thing about that particular video. Uh-huh. I saw it and I saw people sharing and I was shocked. But then when I got to watch because for me I try to yeah, really yeah. That's where you're now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He, it was completely different from the context they had clipped but out. You don't say that. Yeah, and 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 I, I, he later on came to explain. You shouldn't have to even do that. Yeah. In my view, maybe that's a side of the prophetic minister so to say. That irritated me. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe it is a. I don't know. Maybe it's a a mark of of that ministry to I, an extent. I, I don't know. I think sometimes people just crave controversy. Maybe it brings more YouTube views. But then, <laughs> <laughs> but then, in all honesty, like um, if all I ever got to watch was one minute of you, mm. and in the one minute you said sex before marriage is not a sin. And in watching that, I get to go to hell. I don't know. Mm. I I just think that, uh, I think we should be more careful. Mm. And that's why, so you find if I've specific, like let's say the way I'm pastoring a church, Mm -hmm. and someone says that, I would never invite them to that minister. Neither would I ever encourage (laughs) any of our people to watch them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I do think that sometimes in the quest for new knowledge, people try to be too controversial for no reason. Mm. It's a, a thirst for con- the gospel in itself is controversial. It is, and uh, what we believe in in itself is controversial. I don't know why we thirst for more. There are just some things we can deliberately lay aside because I think they've become weights, and um, we end up calling certain people old school for simply calling out nonsense. In yeah. Interview. Hey, like what you see? I know you do. Hit the button below to subscribe and don't forget to hit the notification bell. Ciao.